Hi, this is Fred Tromberg, your host on Life, the Law, and Legal Issues. A special welcome to all of you listening to the show today. We're glad to know you're out there listening. Thanks for tuning in. Thanks for staying tuned in. My special guest this week, very special guest, is Jim Pons, who's written a book called Hardcore Love, Sex, Football, and Rock and Roll in the Kingdom of God. Jim is an amazing guy. He spent years in the music industry as a performer, as the former bass guitarist and singer for several 60s bands, including the Turtles and Mothers of Invention. Remember Frank Zappa? In the 70s, he started a career with the New York Jets in the NFL, became their movie and video director, and he did that for about 27 years. Plenty of stories there to share about his time with the Jets. Now he's written an autobiography and a combined memoir, and he talks about his search for God and spiritual fulfillment in the course of his life. Jim, thanks so much for being on the show today. We welcome you, and we're grateful you took the time out to talk with us. Thank you very much, Fred. I'm happy to be here. And in the words of a couple of people I know, happy to be anywhere. Right? Yeah. <laughs> Your book is essentially an autobiography, a quest for meaning, and a soul-searching exercise. My life has been so uh, blessed with so many interesting and varied experiences that most people don't have. And people always told me I needed to write a book about it someday because it would be entertaining to people. What was it that actually triggered it? What made you say, you know what, today's the day I'm going to do it? Well, I have an answer for that. It was in Ashland, Oregon, where I met one of my spiritual mentors, my idols, uh, Neil Donald Walsh, best-selling author of Conversations with God. When he heard my story, he told me, not only will it entertain people, it'll help people. And that's something that I had never considered before. And Neil actually wrote the foreword to your book. He did indeed, yeah. He offered to... Uh, he actually said he was going to write the first chapter for me because I had started it off on the wrong foot and he wanted me to uh, front load it with some good stories about the Beatles and the White House and things. Right. He called me one day on the phone and said, get your tape recorder ready and listen to this. And he read it to me and I said, this is fantastic. Can I use that as a forward for the book? And he said, absolutely. Well, I have to say that the first part of the book really was very engaging and I've just recently finished reading it. It's a great read. I commend it to everybody that might be listening. And, and we'll talk more about the book in just a moment. It's obvious to me as a reader that you were looking for answers. And uh, what were the questions that you had? Um, early on, my questions were, uh, who is God? Not who is God, but does God love me? Or does he consider me a sinner? I, I remember thinking about that from my earliest years. I was raised in the Catholic Church. For 12 years, I went to school taught by the nuns and priests. And, and I loved God, and I wanted him to love me. I wanted to know him and love him and be loved by him, but I never felt sure that I was. And so the questions that you were thinking about, that you were trying to answer through your writing, had to do with, is God out there for me? Not is he out there. I knew he was out there, but is he for me? Yes. Or against me. I never could resolve that, whether I was made in his image and likeness or born in original sin. Well, what answers are you still looking for, or have you stopped looking? Oh, I'll never stop looking. Came to pretty much of a satisfactory conclusion to whether he loved me or not. Now my questions are more cosmic and questions like, why? Why did he create us, and what are we doing here? And what is the purpose of, of existence? Why is there something and not nothing? Let me get back to your book, Jim. Do you have one or two favorite vignettes, <laughs> favorite stories from your rock and roll days in the 60s and from your time as a musician? Well, uh, so many I could talk about, but the most uh, significant ones would be seeing the Beatles on the Ed Sullivan show for the first time because I had been a student. And that was in your living room in 1964. Correct. I had been a student in college for two years, but not knowing exactly what I wanted to do until I saw the Beatles and realized then that I wanted to be in a rock and roll band. I didn't know how to play anything, and I had no money to buy any instruments, but I just decided then and there I wanted to do that. So you were not a guitarist or a bass player or a drummer or a piano player? No. You, you were not a musician at all, and then the Beatles came on that Sunday night at 8 o'clock, I remember it well, and you said, that's what I want to do. Right. And you did it. It was the first, uh, yeah, I did it. 
it was the first thing I was really passionate about in my life. I knew I wanted to do it, and I knew I was going to do it. Let me ask you in terms of just getting started, because this is 1964. How did you get started with an instrument? How did you get started with the bass? And what made you decide to become rock and roll? <laughs> Again, it was the Beatles, and it was not only the Beatles, it was Paul McCartney of the Beatles, the bass player. A left-handed bass player. Left-handed bass player, but I idolized him. And I chose the bass, not only because he played the bass, but because it only had four strings. Right. As opposed to six. <laughs> so I figured it would be easier. I see. And I picked out three of my fraternity brothers who had a, who looked good, and we taught ourselves how to play some songs. In, in a garage band? Exactly. In a garage of my guitar player's house, living your father's house. Did the neighbors like that? I can't remember, but... <laughs> I bet they did. There were simple songs in those days, and we were able to learn several of them pretty quickly. Right. And we started playing our fraternity, our own, my own fraternity parties. Did you do vocals too? Oh, yeah. And yeah. lead vocals yes. or were yes. you harmony? Lead and harmony. Okay. Was there any pivotal experience that you could think back on in the 60s that changed your outlook on life and what you were doing as a student or as a musician? Not as a student. I guess another significant event in the music business was Pat Boone, the crooner from the 50s. Yeah, sure. He discovered us in a club on Sunset Boulevard called Ciro's. He just started a production company, wanted us to make a record, and we signed a contract with him, and that got us into the studio where we recorded a song that got to be a big hit called Hey Joe. So that was uh, important. And is that is that one you wrote? No. That's a folk song that had been in the public domain. Everybody on the strip was doing it in those days. The birds were doing it. Mm -hmm. Love, a band called Love, was doing it. But we did it a little bit differently, and it became a big hit. Sounds like you had a lucky break there with somebody who was pretty famous listening to you. Oh, yeah, yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. He was very helpful and significant. Give us a... a good guy, too. Is he? Yeah. Okay, give us a, an overview, if you will, of your formative years from the time that you were a teenager through the 60s. Take us through that time in your life. Let's let's start about the time that you were in high school and then in college and then in music, becoming a musician. What kind of youngster were you? Oh, I was a good kid. My family was like the Father Knows Best TV show. My right. dad was a you know, hardworking man. My mom cooked and cleaned house, and we ate dinner together at the dinner table. Very typical family, Catholic school all the way through the 12th grade. But um, I remember, you know, wanting to be sure about whether God loved me. I thought that was the most important thing that I, I, I can remember having that thought all through school. In your book, you write that from the time that you were a, ch a kid, uh, just a child, you had instilled in you that God did love you and that you loved God, and you just wanted to make sure that God loved you back. Yes, well, uh, as I say in the book, Father Harris told me God loved me more than anyone than I would ever understand in, as long as I lived. But Sister St. Lawrence, a nun I had, she caught me eating a ham sandwich one day on a Friday and told me I was going to wind up in hell for the rest of my life with all the other devils burning, suffering. And I couldn't understand how they were both talking about the same person. You thought that that was a little too heavy for a fourth grader. Well, I did, yeah. It, put, it scared me to death, and it's taken all my life to get over it, really. And that's my next question. Do you feel closer now to God in your life uh, with all of your experiences, which have ranged from addictions to some very low points as well as some very high points? Yes, <laughs> very and, much so. And tell us why. I left the Catholic faith after getting out of high school and started exploring Eastern religions and psychedelic drugs and, well, not drugs until I was in the music business, but I wasn't satisfied with Catholic path that I had been on all my life, and I started trying to find God every other possible way. And I began reading other religions and learned how to meditate. I never found what I was looking for. I wanted to know that I was right with God and that he was happy with me and that I had a full experience of him. And that was my underlying feeling in those days. What were the highest points of your high points in the 60s when you were a musician and into the 70s? Highest points? The best points, the nicest, the best memories you've got. You appeared uh, twice, didn't you, on the Ed Sullivan Show? Yes, we did two in, two appearances. And on you the also Ed played Sullivan at the Show. White House with the president's daughter's wedding. 
No, Trisha Nixon's Sweet Sixteen. Oh, Sweet Sixteen. Birthday that's party. right. Yeah, well, yeah. she's the daughter of Richard Richard Nixon. Right. And the Turtles were her favorite band. Ah. She invited us to come play for her party. We were on there with the uh, Temptations and the United States Marine Corps Marching Band. <laughs> I bet that was intimidating. No, no, it wasn't intimidating. We enjoyed ourselves fully. It was very nice. Well, you really... told me there was this one instance, or you didn't tell me this. I read it in the book that um, I guess your drummer had a metronome that was in one of the band uh, uh, bags, and the Secret Service heard something ticking, and they were <laughs> like, hey, everybody, get out of the way here. Let's find out what this is. Oh, yeah. It was that very, had to be an exciting moment. <laughs> it was very alarming. Everybody scrambled. Uh, but uh, yeah, when they found out it was just a metronome, they <laughs> yeah. confiscated it and took it apart. What a sense of relief, right? Uh, for them, I guess, yeah. If you're just joining us, this is Fred Tromberg on Life, the Law, and Legal Issues. And our special guest today is Jim Pons, the author of a book, Hardcore Love, Sex, Football, and Rock and Roll in the Kingdom of God. Jim has written an autobiography from the heart, talking about his high points and low points in the career that he's had spanning decades in music and working for the Jets. That's right, the New York Jets in the NFL. Importantly, he weaves a spiritual journey into the pages of his book and his quest to reach and understand God. Let's talk a little bit about uh, the Turtles for a moment and, of course, the name of the song. Happy Together. Right, and that really was a tremendous hit. I think it displaced the Beatles at number one on the uh, Billboard. Yes, it did. Now that that you really have to you know, think back in perspective, that was absolutely amazing. We're talking about the best songs of rock and roll, and you're going ahead and saying, you know what, we're number one. So let's talk a little bit about you somehow transitioned. Let's tell our listeners. How'd you get out of the music business and into the football business? Um, well, first of all, the, the hits stopped coming, and um, it became more and more difficult to make a living. The actually. well dried up, I guess. Yes. And we also got involved in some very difficult legal issues with our management and record company, and um, lawsuits and depositions became the, the norm for us. It all became very uncomfortable, and and you were—I I don't think you were quite thirty yet at that point, were you? Uh, I was—I had just turned thirty. Just turned thirty. Yeah, yeah. And I began wondering, is there life after music? <laughs> yeah, is this what God wants me to do the rest of my life? And then what happened? Also, I had been really indulging in in the flesh, as mm -hmm. it were, you know, taking advantage of everything that came my way, and was doing some disgusting things that that I knew God didn't want me to be doing right and I, I can tell I can tell you're not proud of but we, we're not going to go there I'm just going to okay. ask him to, about that transition but it was part of why I decided I needed to get out of that business because it wasn't good for me well I can understand that and you then got into working for the New York Jets and yes. an NFL team that <laughs> was just on fire in New York yes and tell us about those years with the Jets first of all how did you get that lucky break I decided to move to New York when I wanted a change of scenery as well as a change in career. I had a friend in New York. He had an office job, office boy job with the New York Jets. And the day I arrived in New York, he got accepted as a film editor for ABC News, which is what he wanted to do. And he asked me, begged me to take this job for the rest of the summer. It was just for the summer. I had to mail Joe Namath posters and, right. and polish the Super Bowl trophy. And that was every day you had to polish Every day, it. Yeah. yeah. I remember that from the book. Paid and you, a, and I, you said, okay, I'll do it. Yeah, I paid $115 a week. And my dad had been very worried about my life in New York, so it was something good I could tell him, and he was satisfied. So that's how it started. And you lost your mom at a young age because of breast cancer, yes. I believe. Yes, Yeah, and you were just, how, how old were you when your mom passed? Well, I was a senior in high school. Ah, so she never saw you on the Ed Sullivan show? No, or... she never saw any of my music. Yeah, I'm so sorry about that. So am I. Now tell me about the Jets. You rose to the top there. You did really great. Apparently, your work ethic was superb, and people noticed you. Well, first of all, they were curious about my career in the music business. That opened a lot of doors. Um, Joe Namath became a good friend. and Turned out he was a real nice guy. Very too. nice. One of the nicest people I've ever met in either either show business. 
music or sports. Mm -hmm. And he took an interest in you, and then you had the equipment manager take an interest in you. The equipment manager became a friend of mine, and then when his assistant quit to join the World Football League, he asked me if I would be interested in moving up to assistant equipment manager, which I grabbed immediately. Then I started working with the coaches and the and the team. Prior to that, I was in the Madison Avenue office with the staff, front office people. Right. Now I was working with the coaches, and we, Bubank, was the head coach. Right. And word got out that I was come from Hollywood, California. In those days, football teams had outdoor companies that shot the games, the films of the games, and right. then deliver them to the coaches on Wednesday and that wasn't satisfactory any longer. We wanted to have them sooner. And football teams were putting film departments on the staff and hiring people to do the camera work and the editing. And we've asked me if I knew anything about movie business. And? And I told him in Hollywood, they called me Cecil B. DeMille Jr. <laughs> <laughs> and that answer was yes. So what Yeah, happened? he said, then I want you to run the film department here. And yeah. I, I didn't even know how to shoot a camera. And I assume you said, yes, sir. I did. I said, yes, sir. I'm the man. Well, that's interesting. Tell us about your beginnings uh, in that position and some of the more interesting little vignettes and stories that you have. Well, it was 16 millimeter black and white film in those days. I had to learn how to run a processing machine and uh, editing copy machine and I had lots of time. I had nothing else to do, so I was able to spend all my time in the film lab learning how to make movies without making mistakes. And you were down on the field, weren't you? I was up in the tower on the field, 40-foot tower, which I shot practice from every day, twice a day during training camp. Weren't you also calling in injuries? Uh, I remember that oh. there was um, a photo in the book and some discussion of the fact that you were down there calling in injuries well that was before i became film director that was when i was still office boy oh okay they let me um they needed somebody on the field to call up to the press box and tell the coaches that were in the press box what the nature of the injuries were on the field so i did that jim was there anything you didn't do it sounds like you did everything but coach um well <laughs> I, there were a lot of things i didn't do but i did quite a few things that i hadn't expected and did we uh, Eubank take care of you? Uh, was he uh, somebody that was a nice guy at the time and looked out yeah, for you? Yeah, very nice guy. And yeah. the owners were wonderful. And uh, it was a wonderful organization. And I say in the book, we didn't win a lot of football games, but we always had a great time. And we were very friendly and loving people. Uh, are there any uh, football players or coaches that you uh, were friendly with that you still have remained friendly with? Jeff Lagerman, who's down here, he's the voice of the, uh, he does the color commentation for the Jaguars. Jaguars. Yeah. He's still a good friend of mine. Kyle Brady was a good friend of mine. Back in those days, it was Joe Klecko and Mark Gastineau and Joe Name. John Riggins was a good friend of mine. Um, Have you stayed in touch with those guys? Not Joe. Not Well, I'm still in touch with Joe through his secretary. I haven't seen John in years. Paul Fraze is another friend of mine who lives here. Well, I'm on that subject, now that you live here in Northeast Florida, what made you move to this area? And in addition to writing, uh, what if, what else have you been do doing now? Uh, what are you up to? Well, first of all, I married and had two sons, and I, I decided I would rather have them being raised in a less a provocative environment. Long Island was becoming difficult. Several of my friends had been traded from the Jets to the Jaguars and and I loved Jacksonville. I'd played here with my bands over the years. And um, my wife and I started talking about relocating. And we came down here and fell in love with it and just decided to move here. And when was that? 2005. Well, good. It means I think you, you've uh, decided to stay. That's great. Yeah, yeah, we decided to stay. She's a physician <laughs> and she now has two offices. So, and I can stay retired. Well, as, as you look back on your career, Jim, what are the lessons you've learned that you can share with our listeners? What are the high points, the low points, and the lessons you've learned? The, fun, the thing that I finally learned that was the life changer was that God did indeed love me, and I found out why, and I described that in my book. <laughs> well, in terms of words of wisdom, that's what I'm getting at uh, for my listeners and oh. their children and their grandchildren. 
Oh. Uh, what's the takeaway from your book? There's a, something that occurred to me. I don't know who said it, but God works in mysterious ways, his wonders to perform. That's been the, the whole story of my life. I was never really qualified to do anything that I've done in my life, and yet well, I've done it. You certainly have plenty of innate ability if you started out not knowing how to play one single note yeah, and well, became a professional musician. God God led me to it and and gave me the ability to be able to do it. And that's just the same with the, the football business, the film business. Is your message that we've got more in us than sometimes we give ourselves credit for? Oh, absolutely. We and have no that, idea how how capable we are of everything. And is that what you see in yourself when you look in the, in the mirror and look back and think back on your life? Yes, and forward, too. Now, you play the bass guitar which is a bass, well, electric yeah, not, bass. Yes, yes. It's four strings, not six. Yes. <laughs> and do you play the stand-up bass as well? I do. I started out playing the stand-up bass because bluegrass music is what I play now, and then bluegrass is very traditional American music. There's electric instruments are frowned upon. So, What's the name of your band? Lonesome Ride. And where do you play? Mostly at festivals around central and south Florida and south Georgia. We play, we play occasionally in Jacksonville, not often, but occasionally. St. Augustine as well? Yes, yes, St. Augustine. I got to look out for you. And where is your book uh, available for purchase? It's available on Amazon and also on my website, jimpons.com. That's J-I-M-P-O-N-S dot com. Correct. And I guess they can purchase it, Barnes & Noble, Amazon, and so um, on. It's print-on-demand, so okay. it's not uh, in the bookstores. Okay, but, but they can purchase it online. Amazon and online on my website. All right, and in the minute that we have, because I told you this was going to fly by yeah. here, in the minute that we have, tell us, are you satisfied with that book? You've won an award already, the Royal Palm Award, which is an amazing award. I was there when you won it. Uh, I have to say, Jim, I thought it was a wonderful read. Are you happy or is there book two in you ready to come on out? Oh, I'm very happy and surprised and blessed and uh, completely blown away by what happened at the awards. I didn't expect to win book of the year. I hoped I might be considered for best autobiography. But book of the year opens doors I can't even imagine yet. Well, you, you, you are reinventing like I'm yourself. I'm on the radio. You're on the radio you with Fred Tromberg, yeah, and you're reinventing I, yourself. Amazing. And you are 74 years old? Yes. And you got another book coming? I I don't know at the moment, but I, I don't ever say never, because who knows? I'm, I have a lot of ideas and a lot of things I want to write. I'm starting a blog to, to start with. And yeah, I think there's I think there's more that God has for me to share. Well, I'll tell you what, I'm looking forward to another book. I'm looking forward to uh, continued friendship as fellow musicians, as fellow writers. Thank you so much for being on the show today, Jim. I know our listeners appreciate your taking the time to be with us. It's been my pleasure. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. I told you that half hour was going to fly by. It did, boy. Our guest has been Jim Pons, a musician, an award-winning writer, award-winning writer, and an author as well as a film and video director for the New York Jets. His book is Hardcore Love, Sex, Football, and Rock and Roll in the Kingdom of God. I want to thank our engineer, Terry Robinson. There she is. Shout out to you, Terry, the single best radio engineer in the business. That board is all lit up. You got those bells and buttons and whistles under control. Very seamless. We thank you for that. As Albert Einstein has said, there are only two ways to live your life. One is as though nothing is a miracle. The other is though we are surrounded by miracles. I'm in group two. Hope you are as well. Till I see you again on the radio. Thank you so much for listening and goodbye.